Okay, I have been uh, making a list of all the things I want to talk about because I am very used to giving PowerPoint presentations and so this is always a, a interesting little challenge for me to not rely on the natural progression of my slides to tell the whole story. So there's all these things I want to say and I'm going to try to say them all and um, so I have a list just to kind of, yeah, but it's not in any kind of order. Um, so we'll just see what ha what comes first. But um, my name is Marisa, and I um, I work at, for New Mexico State University Cooperative Extension Service. Are there any uh, volunteers here that are with Master Gardeners, with uh, Tree Stewards? Yeah. So we have these volunteer organizations around the state, and I'm one of the people that gets to train new volunteers. And I was working at a local nursery. Um, uh, I won't say the name, but it starts with an O. <laughs> uh, and 15 years ago, and I, a customer said, you would, you would like the Master Gardener program. I hadn't heard about it before. I didn't know what a uh, land-grant university was or about ag colleges or things like that. I just didn't know. And um, so I dove into it, and it was really fun. I became a Master Gardener in Albuquerque in 2008 and in 2009 decided to go back to school for a master's in horticulture because I was inspired by the people who teach those classes and um, I thought okay this is where I can take my customer service skills and learn so that I can be teaching and now I get to teach the master gardener classes so um, I stayed at NMSU for a PhD in plant and environmental sciences and I learned all about pecans and the genes that regulate flowering each year and return bloom year after year in pecans. Please don't ask me about that. It was very difficult for me and it's uh, not something I, I mean, I, I can talk about pecans for forever. Uh, Pecanosaur, if you will. Um, but I, uh, I like all different kinds of plants and so I'm now helping other people to grow better and more sustainably in your own yards, right? So that in terms of picking the right species for your yard so that you're not just really killing yourself trying to keep something alive that is doomed to fail and is going to be a problem for maybe the next homeowner in your yard. So we're trying to pick um, more regionally adapted appropriate species and more native plants in our gardens. And we do have a native rose. How many of you here have a native rose in your yard already? That's the, yeah, okay, two of you. Uh, woodsy eye, woods rose. It's the one you'll see if you go like up, up into the mountains and, um, and near the parking lot, kind of, or wherever you are. There's, uh, if you like try to go um, to the edge, to the perimeter, and you're trying to walk through and you get scraped up, that's your woodsy eye. <laughs> oh, you know, um, reddish, red, red, pink. Yeah, yeah, pink. Different, some different, I guess there are some different varieties of it also. But it's one of the ones that instead of uh, being a rose that has some stem and then a thorn and then stem and then a thorn, uh, it is a million prickles. Like you can barely even see the stem. So it's very, very thorny and it does come up. Um, it has a, uh, you know, I'll use the word weedy um, effect of making kind of a thicket of this wild rose. But it's a native flower and it is beautiful and it grows well here. I know I don't like to use the word weed for it because it is, it's, it's a plant that loves being here and it deserves to be here. Who's the weed, right? But, uh, <laughs> but I think um, it is a really good one for a, a more natural effect. And you, don't, you can prune it. You don't have to, right, um, to keep it into, under control. We have some in this learning garden. I'm based in Las Lonas, which is about 30 minutes south of Albuquerque. And we have a research farm there, a learning garden, and uh, that woods rose. And so I, we had volunteers dig up uh, some of the, the volunteers, suckers, um, and sprouts, and to take them home and plant them at home. It grows really nicely. So, okay. So I like to talk about all kinds of things, but we're here to learn specifically about pruning. And I have, I, I like engagement with the audience. I learn more, I have a better time. And y'all, I think, learn a lot from each other's questions. So I have prizes and different kind of levels of prizes for different types of questions. So I think, um, try to keep me to these rules. If you ask a question that is related or is on this list of my topics, 
um, then I have a specific prize for you, and it comes out of this orange bucket. We'll see what it is. Okay, if you ask a question that is, or maybe we get one of these, um, these uh, cuttings I have from peach trees. I can't stand it that you're pruning the peach trees and you're losing all these blooms, so I just bring them inside for the fun of it, just to flower inside. So I have those to give away. Um, but I also, in case, there's, there's this one topic I love to talk about, and so if you mention that, that word, then there's an, uh, uh, like another layer <laughs> of, uh, of gift. Did you know what you said? What? You didn't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, um, pecan's a good one. Yeah, um, uh, it's not a, it's this not is not. one agricultural product in New Mexico. Is that pecan. Why it is it, not necessarily number one. It depends on how you categorize it. There's like ways to categorize your top crop by acreage. Okay. I don't think it would win for that, but it's still very high. You could also, uh, amount of money that's brought in, that is one way to categorize. So it's in the top um, uh, agricultural, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the thing about graduate school is I studied pecans because pecans are well funded. So there's funding for me to do a master's and a PhD, and so uh, that's how I fell into it. Okay, so pecans, yes, they're one of the top crops in New Mexico. They're not native to New Mexico. Pecans are native to the greater Mississippi River, River Valley, wa real wide valley there. Um, but they grow really well in New Mexico and don't have, we don't have as many of the diseases that uh, could harm a pecan crop in other states. So like in Georgia and in Louisiana, they have problems with um, fungal and bacterial pathogens and insects that we just don't have here. So that's one of the reasons they grow so well here. Um, it's an incredible crop. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course not. No, I just don't have as many pistachio puns. <laughs> um, you know, it's not a pecan test. Uh, yeah. um, no, pistachios also grow really well, and that's a great crop for some parts of New Mexico, especially some areas where the pecans don't do as well uh, with saltier soils and, and saltier water. And so that's like the Alamogordo, that Tularosa Basin, they deal with a lot of the, those water issues, and, and pistachios can grow really well in those conditions. Yeah, so pistachios too. There aren't very many pecans up here. There are a bunch in Belen. And I, um, I know that there are some pecan trees around town. I can't think about where they are. Does anybody know where they are? Alameda Park, okay, cool. Yeah, so the question was about, there's two parts and actually you could get double flowers, but we'll see how much there's left over. One of the questions is about when you're trying to cut, uh, there's a rule about the angle of the cut, right? Have you heard that before? Have, what's, the, what's the angle? Forty. Oh, okay, so that's another thing about the vase size, vase, vase shape. Okay, so that's something else. So there's the 45, there's the vase, but then the other thing is trying to, to imagine the future growth of the plant. And so that means that you're pruning very specifically to a bud that's growing in the direction that you want the growth to go. Which is separate from the angle of the cut. Right, so I've got three so things here. Maybe yeah. To me, because I wasn't sure, she's talking about angling a cut. Yeah. So All of them. Uh, There's different. Trying to get the cut. Who cares about angle? Where yeah. the bud is to get that. Bud yeah. To, to, so that question was. Good. Uh, yes. Question so, was so then, about. all right. So one thing. Let's talk about the vase first. And we also talk about this open center or vase pruning when we're talking about fruit trees, right? So in a lot of other climates, they recommend, say, for your plum, that you want to prune for an open center. And so you pick the way they say it is five three to seven scaffolding branches that are going to be your, your main stems, and then you kind of clean out, you don't have as much growing in the center. There are some benefits to that, getting sunlight into the center, uh, getting air into the center and less disease and leaf problems. And we don't tend to have those issues as much in New Mexico. So it's not the open center thing. In terms of fruit trees, I'm not convinced that it is what we should be doing with our fruit trees. And in fact, the more we learn about the, the different types of leaves within a single canopy, there are sun leaves and there are shade leaves, and they are reacting differently to the environment. The sun leaves may not be using the sunlight as 
efficiently because they're just really trying to shade the inside of the plant. Whereas the, ins the, little the leaves inside that we used to clean out because that open center, the vase pruning, but also people used to call it a trashy trunk. And so we would say prune out those little leaves. But now we realize that those are actually photosynthesizing at a much more efficient rate because they're not having to beat the sun the whole day. And so we want to have leaves on the outside, those are the sun leaves, and leaves on the inside and the interior. Now you're talking just specifically now about fruit trees. Uh, uh, both, in this, in both. This so, 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 this, so for the, op the, the rules about open center in, in uh, roses may not be as important in New Mexico where we don't have, where first of all, we have got plenty of sun, we're not trying to get more sun in the center, right? And we don't have the, the fungal and bacterial problems that build up with that moist tissue. Uh, to, you know, we do have some, but so, so I guess vase pruning, if that works for you and you want to do it, then do it. I don't necessarily think that's the most healthy option for our roses. Have you heard that before, right? You know what I mean? Like having a, a rose. And if you go to the um, Tony Hillerman Library Rose Garden, the Albuquerque Rose Society maintains this beautiful garden. If you can go in May, you will uh, run out of room on your phone for photos because you're going to take so many beautiful pictures. They are doing dim different demonstrations even today of ways to prune. And so you'll see that when you, if you go, were to go now and see what they look like right after the pruning, you'll see that more open center. And so it still works and it is still recommended here, but I just am not sure that it's as necessary as it is in other places. So well, just to say, let me go back. Okay, so we got the open center, that's base. Then you had the angle. So the angle, people say 45 degree angle. And the, I have a lot of problems with that and I get cut up on my arms too when I'm doing it. So the idea there, I pruned a rose uh, bush in the learning garden yesterday and brought the cuttings just so I could play around with it. All right. So here's uh, one of the stems that I pruned out. And I actually don't know which kind of rose. This was planted before I started working there. It's probably um, six or seven years. Oh, I, did, I have been working there that long, but I don't know what kind of rose it is anyway. So this one um, has big, beautiful flowers. It, and you can see this brown where it died back this winter, right? The brown tip. So that's kind of obvious. We're going to prune that out. But I went ahead and took a lot out of this. So this was, I have photos from before and after, but on the, on the shrub, this was probably this tall. And so I went in and took half of this branch out. Um, and did I prune it to the right angle? Well, you can't tell by looking at this cut end because the, the one that I, you know, maybe it grew like that or maybe, you know, but the idea is you want to prune at a 45 degree angle. So if this is coming straight up, you're pruning kind of like this. Right? And then this is the stem that's left over. And the reason for the 45 degree angle is also something that we don't really worry about in New Mexico. And that is if you have a really humid environment because you live in Florida and there's rain every day and humidity, then there's water building up here that can rot and cause a dead spot. And so the 45 degree angle is to help water fall off the cut edge. You know, I would, like, wouldn't it be great if that was a problem here? It's not. So the 45 degree angle thing doesn't really matter to me either. And at that, for that matter, the way that I'm doing it is I, those branches in the center that you're trying to get out, but you don't want to put your hands all the way in there, I kind of reach in and pull and then either with loppers or maybe you have somebody else to help you if you had loppers, and then I cut. And then when I let go, it springs back into place. And so even when I try to do a 45 degree angle, it ends up being this like perfect surface, right? Because I'm because it's wiggling with me. So it just doesn't import, it does that part doesn't doesn't matter to me. And actually, what I'm a little bit more worried about generally with pruning cuts on fruit trees or with roses is that the any kind of cut is an injury, and they respond to that with energy going to that spot. And so you are hurting your rose bush by pruning and your fruit tree and your all your other things. So we want to prune m as minimally as possible and we want our cuts to be as gentle as possible. And if you were instead of a 45 to do a 75, a 85, right? A, a, a much deeper angle, that means you're getting a much larger surface area wound. That is a harder to, to think about your finger, right? Or your the cut that you have, it's like 
you want to, so 45 maybe is that sweet spot where anything from a, a 90 to a 45, I should have said so, whatever, anyhow, <laughs> um, you, you understand my point. If you were to cut at such an angle that you are making this long oval cut, right, like this, that's no good. I mean, it's okay. It's not going to kill the shrub, but it's just a larger wound to seal. It's a bigger ga uh, gaping wound and... Um, so that's the, not the best practice, right? So we're trying to keep the cuts to smaller and gentler. Um, yeah. Now, I lost that little spot. Somebody's gonna, that's gonna fall on your, in your get, in, get on our shoe. Now let's, let's see, another thing is to use the trick of when you're picking these up to try to take them away, uh, to, you can use your whatever shears you have or loppers as tongs, right? To, pull that, that, you just cut that branch, instead of reaching in with your hand or cutting up your forearm to use your tongs uh, like that. And so that helps. Um, there are some real problems. Maybe your skin does not respond that badly to rose scratches, but a lot of people do react with like an allergic type reaction. It puffs up, it takes a long time to heal, depending on how deep it is. So it is a problem. I do recommend long sleeves. Uh, the two layers of shirts, um, two layers of gloves, depending on how thin yours are. Um, but okay, let's look, let me go back to V, vase, 45, and then the bud direction. That's kind of the most fun part. Yeah, and so I, yeah, so I, so I brought, and I don't, that, what's your, what's your name? Okay, so Connie got the first present, but I promise there's plenty. So, you know, I don't, if I, if I forget to give out a, um, a gift, please correct me. So I'm going to use this example. This is a peach, uh, peach stem, and so that looks like I, that was cut at a 45. Um, so that's neat. Okay. Um, the smaller the, the the stem when you make the cut, the less you have to worry about uh, how what kind of wound it is, right? Um, but anyway, so this was this was trimmed, and let's say we are thinking. Let's say we just have this this top and we can pretend in our heads it doesn't matter is it a rose is it a is it a peach so we have these branches here and I want to encourage and it depends on your situation and what you have in your yard and what you want it to do but if you want to encourage the peach tree the new branches to grow towards me then I look for buds that are pointed towards me and I see this kind of obvious one right this pretty one there so actually I'm gonna pretend that we want the peach tree to grow towards you and so what I'm doing there is I'm going in and I'm doing my cut right above, how far above, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, if you do it too close, it will dry up and kill that bud right there. And then the next bud down is pointed right here in the center. That's exactly what I didn't want, right? But if you do it too far up, then there's some dieback. Meh, I'd rather have a little bit of dieback. So I go like a quarter or a half inch up and I'm gonna prune this so that the new growth is really going to be encouraged to come from that way and go in that direction. So in the case of your open center kind of rose, I mean, okay, still, you, maybe you want the rose bush to, to grow outward and to sh be showy with the flowers all around. And so you're, you're pruning down to a bud that is growing in the direction, pointing itself at the direction where you want to go. And some people think pointing is rude. So these buds are very rude, right? They're all pointing in the direction they want to grow. The, statistically speaking, if you were to cut this branch here, the new growth is statistically more likely to occur at the bud that's closest to that cut end. You're removing a signal, uh, a growth hormone signal from the tip. Every tip of these has these little growth hormones that are building up in it. You're removing that, and the plant's reaction is, oh, we got to send more of the growth hormone up there because it's missing. So that it's almost like the tip is restricting the, it's not almost, this is what's happening. The, the, the tip, the hormones in the tip are telling the rest of the stem to kind of settle down. I got this covered. I'm going to be the one that grows forward. And when you remove it, you're giving the signal for these other buds. And so the buds closest to this cut are more likely to branch out. So I've, I can see there's one here, one here, one here, and it doesn't always, it's not always the case, but that's one thing to think about. So if you are trimming your rose and you have this one bud with your eye on it, 
it probably is going to be the one that, that gets the surge of energy, but might not. And then you can decide to cut it back. And if, it, if you go back in three weeks and, and it's not growing the way you want, you can cut it again. It's not like there's this one window and then once that window is gone, you should never cut again. That's something I think that, I think that we learn it wrong in fruit trees too because we're learning from these written materials or, or teachers who are trying to teach about show roses, right? And how to get the biggest, most incredible flowers so you're gonna win at the state fair, which sounds really fun and I guess I want that <laughs> now that I say it. But, um, and also for, for orchards, for fruit trees, they're talking about best practices for maximizing your fruit production for your commercial venture. Whereas for us at home, for most of us, we're just trying to get these plants to grow with us, right? You know, it's like, let's just, let's just do it as best we can. And so it's okay. So my point is that a lot of times the rule of prune your fruit trees or prune your roses at the end of the winter before the last frost, if you miss the window because life is busy and you got scared and distracted and somebody texted you at the wrong time, then that's okay. You can do it in October. You can do it in February. You can do it in June. It's going to be okay. And that's um, one thing I really like about teaching this class with a little bit more flexibility is that I think that the, the hard and fast rules, it's not that they're not correct, it's that there's a lot more wiggle room than you think. And so one thing I'd like to ask at the rose pruning talks is how many of you have been growing roses for more than 10 years? <laughs> okay, that's a lot. All right, and so you've been pruning sometimes, pr at least some of you have been pruning your roses those times. Have you ever made a pruning cut that killed your plant? Oh. Oh no, okay, well you're not supposed to speak up. Or <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I have something for you. This is a little, so before coming here today, I went to the, um, Valle de Oro is our wildlife refuge down in, in uh, near the airport, and it's the only wildlife refuge in the country, I think, that's within the city limits like this. And so they had their habitat, thank you, backyard refuge uh, day today, and they were giving away native plants and, and free plants that are good for pollinators and for birds. And so this is this little blanket flower. So here you go, a little, bl little sweet oh, blanket. So there you go. <laughs> so it may be that the rose you pruned, that it died or it's dying or didn't thrive because that was going to happen anyway, right? And not because of how you cut it. Yeah. But I guess my point was trying to be, you're really not going to, same thing kind of with your peach tree. You're not, I mean, don't go and whack it off at the base, but you're not going to kill your tree with these cuts. So it's okay to get your hands dirty and make a couple cuts that you uh, aren't sure about and learn from them, right? And that's the beauty of, of what we're all, we're all learning. So I like to have, I buy this fancy flagging tape with uh, check marks and, and whatever, different colored, pretty colors, but you could use anything, right? Something that's stretchy, like those kinds of tomato uh, vining, those, those kinds of ribbons. If you make a cut and you're like, huh, I wonder what's, like, that's get, what's gonna happen to that next year or, or in three months. Put a little ribbon around it and go back and look at it. Take a photo of it. Photo journaling is really, really helpful in the garden because um, it'll take me a long time to write a paragraph about what that cut edge looks like, but I can go back to it. So, so you know, make a big cut, uh, or do a 40, couple of 45 degree angle cuts and then do a couple other angles and go back and look. I think you're gonna be okay and you'll learn from it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wild. wild yeah bushy yeah. I want that for mine I have a, um, a lady banks rose that's waiting to be planted this year as soon as I can so um, yeah I am a, I'm a fan of the climbing roses and if you knew when you have one in your neighborhood you know it right they're beautiful and at the at the um, Tony Hellerman library they have some climbing roses that are beautiful so there are some rules I always it's like I can't keep some of these rules in my head so I have to go back and follow other people's guidelines. So this is a New Mexico State University publication called Growing Roses. And I go back and look at it to see what does it say about climbing roses specifically. 
So climbing roses are pruned to develop new vigorous canes and to adjust the size to the trellis, pergola, fence, or place where they're being grown. These plants, this is the key, they blossom on one and two-year-old wood. So the, so the key there, they blossom on one and two-year-old wood. So that means that the, anything that is bushing out now, right, this, all this, this greenery, this is less than one year, right? This is just the last month wood. But this tissue from last year, this is the stuff that's the one year old, it's from last year. And then you can follow that down and see that maybe the year before, I don't know exactly, but maybe it was this long. So the point being, if you prune too much new material out, you're pruning out your blo blossoms for that year. So you could just wait till after they bloom and then decide what you want to cut back. That's one way to do it. Yeah. It's push, you know, it's focusing on new growth. Yeah. So I guess I think. So so the reason that it's not so when you, when you say bold on the bottom, that's that's kind of bold in a good way, and that was intentionally done that way, right? So I think um, I don't know that you are going to be able to get it to to branch out lower. Where I mean, maybe, and sometimes plants. Uh, yeah, and so you could encourage those if you want. Prune climbers in late spring after the first heavy crop of blooms have faded. Excessive pruning removes, removes flower buds. Plants which have not been pruned for several years are usually thick and bushy with old and new and perhaps even dead canes. Prune these while the canes are dormant when it's easier to see. That's one reason to prune it when it's dormant, but you can do this. Do it. If, you, if you can tell that, that there's dead wood in there, you can prune that out anytime. My next door neighbor has these roses that are probably this tall. And when she prunes them, she prunes off just a couple inches. And so they're just real leggy underneath and there's no leaves under there. And then they do bloom and they look pretty, but they don't bloom, I think, as much as if she were to give them a real hard cut every couple of years um, and then have them sh sh you know, branch out from that. Um, but she doesn't ask me for advice, so um, yeah. So, so what do you do when you have these big woody canes? It's an old shrub and it hasn't been pruned. I know. And so the, the, the recommendation may be different than what I would personally be able to do because I'd just be too scared. It's like it's, it takes a lot of guts to do some of these cuts. <laughs> so uh, I think that my, I remember giving this advice last year was what if you were, so maybe the rule is to go ahead and be bold and cut it down low this when you're trying to revive an older plant. But if you don't have the guts to do that, what if you did four or five of the major branches, major, you know, big cuts this year, and do the, the others like next year? You can kind of layer it and learn from that. That's, as far as learning at home, I, I would recommend doing that. That way you're not, but also shop around and look, maybe you're gonna have a rose to, you know, maybe you're gonna, it's not gonna do well and you're gonna wanna replace it. You could go ahead and pick something else to plant next to it. Um, the same is true of these peach trees. I inherited these from a uh, predecessor, uh, Dr. Ron Walser, who planted them 15 or 17 years ago. And he, um, and they had been pruned correctly or the way he intended in the first couple of years. And then he retired and they were just left and forgotten for uh, neglected for a number of years. And the canopies grew up and started to cover in and that means that not very much sunlight is coming in. It's a beautiful shady walk in the summer. Not very many weeds under there, so there's some benefits. But the uh, same is true in roses, where you'll get uh, the flowers right at the tips and not that much down in the center. So it's like, and same thing for peaches. You get most of your fruit production just like way out on the tips, and it really minimizes the amount of fruit you can get from a tree. Same thing with pecan. They have research in pecans that shows that by regularly pruning you're allowing more sunlight into the middle of the canopy and getting maximizing your harvest potential so there are there are rules like that and i just don't have them in my head but we could find them we'd have to know which type of rose you have um, and so that's part of the you know you can bring a photo of your rose in to a place like this and ask somebody here you can compare it to some of them it's likely a hybrid tea rose i'm guessing right that's most common in in decades past 
Um, but, but so I was worried about pruning these big fruit trees so back so far because it we got to the point where it's like either we're going to have to remove every other tree to allow more light in or we should do some severe pruning. So Ron Wallister, even though he's retired, he just turned 80. I follow him on Instagram. He's still planting fruit trees all over in down in Chihuahua, Mexico and up in Utah. And so we FaceTimed and I told him this is what I'm thinking of doing is coming in on these. This is this is a pretend old tree, right? So the trunk is is like this and just really cut them off because what I'm trying to do, remember we talked about trying to encourage that flush of new growth underneath the new cut. I'm trying to get that to happen here. Some plants leaf out and branch out better or worse, depending on what you're trying to do, do at a cut than uh, below the cut end than others. And he warned that peaches and cherries and the prunus species may not do what you want. They're not as prone to sending out new, a flush of new growth like a little chia. Whereas mulberries, like that's one reason that topping is so bad for trees, especially in mulberries and things like that, where you top your tree and then you get this flush of growth from each stem. Each of those little branches is less secure than uh, the original branching structure. And so they're more likely to break in the future, more likely to have problems. And that's one of the reasons that, that topping is bad. On a rose, uh, what can happen, and I, uh, I'll quote uh, George Duda, a local forester who says that trees make liars out of all of us because it doesn't always work this way. But what can happen is maybe you don't see any buds down here on this older big stem and you cut, but the d buds are in there, they're dormant, and they will be uh, awoken by removing the top and, and branch out. That's what we want to happen. That's what is going to happen unless it's not right. So I think um, we need to be flexible with our expectations there. I would try it on yours. If it's a sentimental rose to you, you could do a couple. Like I said, don't do all of them in one year. I, I, I also have had people say, I have this rose bush that's from my grandmother and I, I'm killing it. And I don't want it to, I can't die. And I just have to really think about my own grandmother and, uh, I quoted her already today. Uh, she, she said, um, she who dies with the most fabric wins. <laughs> but I think about my own grandmother, and she and I never talked really about plants. I didn't like plants back then. But I have to just imagine that she would be OK with me buying a new rose or maybe something else to put in that spot. And so kind of getting over some of that fear and attachment to something that you can't control. So in any of this, any of this, really, the best thing we can do for all of these plants, whatever you're talking about, is as you're sitting there thinking about what am I going to prune, really think about how can I use this time being close to the plant to problem solve and start changing some of my strategies to increase uh, the future of this, you know, future health of this plant. That happened to me with a butterfly bush that just really wasn't, I planted it near my mailbox. I want this butterfly bush to be out there right near the curb so everybody can enjoy it and myself. And uh, it just really wasn't growing very well. And my friend said, I recommend you cut it back really strong to try to encourage that flush, flush of new growth. And I was reluctant. I didn't. I mean, I believed him from the, from the plant physiology standpoint, but I've never done that with this. It worked really well. So um, I actually wanted to do it again this year. And he said, why would you do it two years in a row? I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> got a little too, uh, too excited about it. But So this is something I got wrong when I was in the Master Gardener program because I mixed up annual pruning with deadheading. Okay, so the rules for deadheading, that means removing splint, <laughs> spent flowers, and uh, they're a little bit different than they are for pruning. So we're, when we're talking about pruning, we're talking about basically this time of year, but again, you can do it anytime, uh, of, of doing a heavy cut. But when we're talking about deadheading, that's when you're trying to cut to, um, to encourage new blooms and just to kind of remove some of the shabby blooms. And some plants you don't do it as much on and some it doesn't really matter. I actually deadhead when the flowers are, are still looking beautiful so I can give them away to people or take them to classes and give them away. But um, so, so when you're deadheading, the recommendation is, so say you have this, this stem and you have this big beautiful flower on it and then the flower started to fade, and I've heard this called the, I wrote it down, the shatter stage. 
The shatter stage is when you like wiggle the stem and the petals start to drop. Okay, so if you do that and they don't start to drop, then you're not quite at the stage. To me, I'm like, if I'm standing there with my pruning shears, that's the stage, right? <laughs> I mean, how many, it's like, how many days in the week do you have to prune your roses? So um, anyway, the idea is you have this big flower here. It was beautiful. It's died back. There's another flower that's going to be here. Let's go ahead and cut this one out. Many reasons you can do that. You don't have to. But it, depending on how you do it and when, it can encourage more blooms through the year. Same thing with we talked about that flush of growth, right? Removing that cut stem is a clue. The plant's like, oh, I need to fill that void and put another flower out. So um, that rule applies there. So see how skinny this little stem is, right? This little guy. Um, this is not the size of your pinky finger or a number two pencil is another one I've heard. The idea there is if you were to cut the flower off, and leave this little skinny twig and you get a new bud here and a new flower it's not strong enough to really uh, support a whole new flower and sometimes it doesn't kind of doesn't know that and so it might still try to produce a flower and be a problem so that's kind of and there, there's also that rule of leaves of leaves of three leaves of five have you heard that before what is that? I know yeah well that's part of this deadheading thing so another rule of green thumb is when you're trying to deadhead instead of cutting up high to try to go down lower where the stem is thicker and another indicator of that is that the the leaves are fully expanded and developed so let's see this may not be the best example but closer to the flower these so this whole thing is a leaf right this is one leaf it's a compound leaf that has five leaflets and closer to the flower there tends to be only three leaflets and so they say cut back to leaves of five they should say leaflets of five but so that means you're cutting back lower on the stem which is the same thing you're doing if you follow that pinky rule or the number two pencil rule so they're both just ways to get you to prune back a little further than you might think but when you're trying, when it's this time of year and you're like, okay, I'm, today's the day, I'm going to town on my rose, I gotta decide what to cut, you can cut out this smaller wood, right? That's kind of easier um, to, to remove. You can also, um, yeah, you can also cut back in height, like we talked about, right? So in this one, I cut this back by half, pretty much. Um, but I think her question is more about deadheading, but the problem that I had when I was learning this is that I, th I was mixing the two goals, right? So I was like, why would you prune back by half when you're supposed to just prune back to the number two size? Like, they, they didn't make sense. That's because it's two different purposes of pruning, two different times of the year that you're pruning. The, if you look at any of these, these uh, guides to pruning, they say prune your roses two or a couple number, a certain number of weeks before your last frost. But guess what? We don't know when that what, that's going to be. So that's always made me uncomfortable, right? Um, so if you are really dead set on following that rule and you prune, then you're helping us to have a more wild last frost date that year, right? It's like, it's just really not something we can predict. There are rules to help people just make a decision. And uh, one recommendation, and you'll see this a lot of places, says prune one to two weeks before your last frost date. The reason that we have that rule is it's kind of cool. So peach trees go dormant. So the question of when do you prune? Well, it depends on our last frost date, really. And so I have a different recommendation than you're going to find on a lot of these things. So they're going to say, oh, that's right. I was going to get into this. So we're talking about plants going dormant and coming out of dormancy in the spring. So peaches go dormant. That means that they drop their leaves. They send leaves to nest. That fall comes and they drop their leaves in the, in the fall. They go through this dormant period where they're accumulate in the bud they're accumulating time at a certain temperature and the temperature is like just above freezing and then once that it's like a it's like it gets checked off once it gets a certain number of hours that's called the chill hours the requirement for this then there's a certain number of heat units it needs it's again in the bud these little chemicals are building up and it's like an hourglass kind of metaphor where these ch the chemicals building up in the bud when it gets to a certain amount of cold it switches into okay now we're accumulating heat units and then you accumulate heat units and then when you get to a certain trigger point it induces bud break 
and is able to break and then bloom. Roses don't really go dormant. And the way we know that is because this drops its leaves in, in at Thanksgiving, this one drops its leaves at Thanksgiving, but if we had several weeks of warm weather in December, this one would stay dormant and this one would start to grow and branch out. So even though it's slowed and dropped its leaf, it's not really dormant. So that idea of when you prune, <laughs> back to that, is that you want to prune so that you're uh, pruning off the dead wood, you're doing your size reduction so you don't get this leggy beast that then you have to make difficult decisions with years later. And, uh, and so you want to prune late enough that your new growth doesn't get damaged by a late frost. We just are going to sometimes do it right and sometimes not. So if you have the luxury of having two pruning days, prune once, uh, you know, the beginning of April. And if you get some more cold days and some of the die back, you can prune again. That's okay. The only drawback there is that your neighbor who waited may get bloom blooms at a different time as you. But really, it's going to be okay either way, right? So, so let's see. You could do what I do, and it's just like, wait, 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 because I don't know why I can't do things on time. So that means that when I do prune, I might be pruning out some of the buds that were going to bloom earlier. And that's, that's one problem is that you, it's like, okay, I've, I've waited too long. Now I'm going to go out and prune. And then when you get there and you get close to it, you see all these buds and you don't have the heart to cut them off. You, I mean, I'm going to say should, although I get it. You should go ahead and make that cut because overall and for the long-term health of the plant, that for your rows, that will be, be better and, a, and an easier decision for you to make the next year, right? But also you can leave it and guess what? It's going to live and it's going to bloom pretty and, and be okay. So the question is, should I prune these lateral branches? So, so a lot of people are going to say yes, partly because they're likely coming from the root stock. And for almost all of the roses, maybe not the climbers, maybe not the miniatures, but almost all of them, the root stock is this one variety that's called Dr. Huey. And Dr. Huey is named after the rosarian who uh, bred this plant that became this wonderful rootstock for almost all of the roses you, you buy at rose sales and, and in one gallon pots or, or bare root. And so Dr. Huey has a uh, clustering dark red rose flower. So have you ever had it happen before where you buy this rose and it's yellow and then you get new stems and somehow it's red? That's Dr. Huey, gro Huey growing up from the rootstock. I like it. It doesn't bother me. Um, there is some, there is some uh, belief that similarly to this peach tree, woo, that, the, that the, when the roots come up and it sprouts out from the base, that this tr that it's competing with the main tree. I don't quite, I can't quite believe that because I'm thinking about the leaves that form on the little stems, the suckers that you don't want. Those sugars are going eventually down into the roots also. It just doesn't really bother me. I, I like having the dark red rose with the rose that I originally bought. I think that's okay. But if you don't want that, or if you just need to control the size because it's in a container, then yeah, you can prune those back. Um, if you go to the, the uh, Tony Hillerman gar garden and look around it, there, it's, just, it's just the landscape planted around the library. It's very accessible. So you can walk around and everything's labeled. Most things are labeled. And so you can find Dr. Huey is there next to, and, it's a, and they, let, they have it there as a demonstration of what the uh, kind of hom homage to the rootstock for most of our, our plants. But something else I was going to talk about with containers is that you can grow containers successfully in, uh, grow roses in containers for a long time. And there are some, clu some, some clues. One is to, not clues, but keys. One is to not use soil from your yard, but to use a potting soil that is well draining, porous soil where the, they don't, the roots don't sit in muck. And so that's going to be true in containers too. The other thing that is, a, is good advice is to either paint your containers a lighter color or white to really reduce the amount of heat that is um, building up on the side of the container. So a lot of this, the black plastic is much sturdier and is not going to rip as much. Um, but if you could spray paint them white, that's what I do with some of mine, or a lighter shade of whatever, right, gray or, or blue or whatever you want to go. Um, I think that's going to be beneficial. The question is about fertilizer. And so I don't fertilize my roses, and maybe they don't produce as much flowers as they would if I fertilized them, but I just don't. 
Um, I've seen a lot of damage from over fertilizing, and so I'm worried about that. And I think that we as a culture are, it's almost like, well, um, so, so, so there's some, these are, I have extreme fertilizer views, right? And we're standing all next to all these uh, chemicals too, but, <laughs> but um, the, the, some of the rules of thumb might, so how many of you know my predecessor, Curtis Smith? And if you don't, you may, not, yeah, so Curtis Smith, so I was with him in Raton and we were talking to gardeners um, a couple years ago and he said something I thought was really helpful. Think of fertilizer like you think of ice cream. When you're strong and healthy, it can be a nice treat. When you're not your best, it's probably not the right option for you. So, so it's like, I think sometimes we think of fertilizer like medicine, but it's more like a Coca-Cola, right? So does it give you this surge of energy? Yes. But then it's really, if you weren't really your healthiest and you didn't have the, the capacity for that energy surge, it can be harmful. And we see um, fertilizer burn in roses all the time when the leaf margin dies and you have crispy leaf margin. So like if this is, I'm the leaf and this edge here is brown and crispy, maybe uh, think about the fertilizer or, or salts specifically because fertilizer is, is a form of salt and it can be um, it can cause burn in feed. So, so yes, we use we use the term fertilizer and we use the term feeding. We think that's the same, but plants create their own food. So it's more like a, a sugary extra treat, right? Which I'm not. No, I'm not against those actually. <laughs> <laughs> but right. So, um, so when we say plant food, most people are thinking of fertilizer. But the truth is that plants are making their own food. That's why we love them. That's why it makes them. That's their whole thing. Yes, so mulch. Mulch is my favorite word. So mulch is my magic word. I love mulch. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not the prettiest word, mulch, but it is, um, it is important. And man, there's so many benefits. But really, moisture retention in the soil, keeping the roots have, uh, where they have access to water, more efficiency with water, those are all the benefits of mulch. And your roses are going to benefit from that as long as you have good draining soil then having a two to four, no, four to six inch layer, that's pretty thick, layer of mulch. I guess you could take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and fold it in half. We're talking about minimum, right, of this depth of mulch. So um, that's going to help to keep weeds back. It's also going to shade the soil, keep it cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter like a little blanket. Um, what else does it do? Yeah. What's that? Oh, so as plant, so if you're using a, um, a natural material that's from a dead plant tissue, like, or a live plant tissue for that matter, it will break down over time and add nutrients to the soil, which is a form of fertilizer. That's nature's form of fertilizer, right? Think about the forest, right? So the leaves break down over time. And, uh, and that is adding nutrients back into the soil. So that's a great way. So that's all, there's a whole campaign that's called Leave the Leaves, right? Because uh, leaf, that leaf material can be really beneficial. I mean anything that is natural and available to you and that you like the look of it or that you, uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter to me. It could be pine needles, it can be leaf litter. Pine needles are good? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Even back east where they have acidic soil, pine needles are good. Whatever it is, if you're uh, pine chips, um, shredded bark, whatever's on sale or that you like or that you can load or that you have access to. And there are differences in these different materials. And so I brought some of these. These are handouts that look at the, look at the different types of mulches and the uh, benefits of pros and cons of different ones. So. You can have a copy of that. And if I have a couple copies, but. Now, yeah. let me ask this. So, say you put them all down. Now, next year comes around. Do you take those old ones out, or do you just put new on top? Or? You could put new on top, or you could leave it for a couple years until it breaks down. In more humid, more moist environments, that thick, that six inch layer breaks down quicker, and so you're going to need to add it. Our climate, things don't tend to break down so much, and so uh, you maybe you won't have to add very often. Um, I let the, the mulberry leaves just fall and then they kind of whip around with the wind wherever I don't want them and then uh, eventually I pile them up around some of the shrubs that I'm trying to protect in the winter um, and they break down and, and so the, the, mulch, the, the leaf pile just kind of 
murk, 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 through different rains and pecan shells. Yeah, yeah. Um, pecan shells are a great uh, option for uh, for mulch. It looks really pretty to a lot of people. Now, if you're wanting to go barefoot, it's not the right option. That's very painful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, um, if Austrian copper rose, does anybody have one? Yeah. Okay. And so, how ha how does it grow in your yard? Do you need a? Yeah. So I'm just googling Austrian copper rose. Mine's not yet either. I don't know what they're and so it's a Persian yellow rose. So maybe this is one of those old world roses yeah. that's more shrubby. And okay. And so for the for the shrub roses, maybe uh, depending on where you have it planted and what you want, you may never have to prune it. Soil drainage. And if you don't know what kind of soil you have, you can dig a hole and fill it with water. And s how long does it take for that to to drain out? If you go back the next day or in two days and there's still water in the hole, that's called clay. And maybe you're going to need to grow your roses in containers, right? Or you could try, but or maybe a woods rose, um, like a more native rose, will be better adapted for your soil. Aphids. Okay, so aphids, there's a couple things you can do. And I have done it before where I used one of these soil drench chemicals. I don't know which one I used. Um, uh, something like it was made for roses, and it was like, it feeds and it also deters pests. I'm not using that anymore because I'm not as scared of aphids as I used to be. But um, so if you have the, t the chance and you're out in your garden, you can turn your water stream on like a little bit stronger, but not so strong that you blow the heads off. But you want to blow the heads off the aphids and not off the roses. <laughs> um, and you can just rinse your roses and they, they're slow crawlers. So it takes them amount of like their whole lifespan or whatever to get back up to that spot. So you're kind of just torturing them again and again. That's like, that's cool. Um, also though, that's one reason to worry about too much fertilizer is that aphids and other of these pest insects, they love that new growth material. And so if you're feeding every two weeks with, excuse me, I used the wrong word. If you're fertilizing every two weeks, then you're increasing the chance through the summer that you're gonna have aphid problems and be dealing with that all along. That's one thing. Another thing is that the way that our, our world works, our natural world, is that once you have a pest population, pest again is in quotes because eh, they're okay, um, as aphid populations go up, it takes a certain, it ta you have to get a lot of them there before the beneficial insects start coming into the rescue. And if you are constantly, you know, you, you fertilize, you get an aphid flush, and then you use a chemical to do that, and then you're using a chemical, you know, right? You're just like kind of perpetuating this problem that wasn't necessarily that big of a problem. So you can um, let the aphids get to a certain level and, and you'll have some damage on some of your roses. And then when you look closer and you see some of our beneficial insects, um, of course, I'm thinking of ladybugs and mantids and lace wings, and there's so many um, beneficials, then you can say, okay, well, it turns out that they're benefiting from this. And so that's going to be okay. Like, or there's those apps now that you take a picture of a leaf and it says it needs sulfur, right? Well, it's just not that simple because the way that nutrients move into the plant is through the roots. So a lot of times the nutrient deficiency or toxicity has more to do with how water is moving in the soil and how roots are drawing up water than it does the actual nutrient content of the soil, right? And um, on the way here, I'd listened to a podcast by a rosarian. He was like the president of the blah, blah, American Rose, all these things. He said, test your soil. If you have, if you're lacking in a specific nutrient, you can look for a um, fertilizer that has that nutrient and apply that nutrient. Um, but he said, specifically, he has a problem that he sees all the time. He's in Tennessee, but um, with too high phosphorus, that when phosphorus builds up in the soil, people will say, man, I, have, I had this rose bush and it looked great and it's just not growing very much anymore. They do a soil test and they find apparently that phosphorus was high. So you can have as many problems with too much nutrient as you can with too little. Um, also a wonderful local resource, Judith Phillips. I, met, I talked to her earlier today. She was at Valle de Oro. And she said before that 
in terms of these chores like pruning, by fertilizing, overly fertilizing, that just means you're having to cut back more. I mean, it's like we're, we're just, and, and the, in the, if you don't cut it back more, it's using more needing and using more water. So in terms of <laughs> reducing our need for water and for pesticides, cutting back on fertilizer, those are some, some reasons. But this also guy, this, this guy, and I forget his name, but it was a um, Oregon State University podcast on, on expert rose gardening. He also recommended compost, and so you can either purchase it or you can make it your own, and top dress your soil with uh, compost, and then as you water, those nutrients break down and move into the soil and feed the beneficial microbes and those things. He also mentioned the problem with Epsom salts and how that is one of these myths that won't die. Um, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. So if, you, if your soil test shows that you're low in magnesium or sulfur, maybe that's an option that you should be doing. But otherwise, magnesium sulfate is another form of salt, and it can cause uh, problems and be beneficial. Maybe you use a, a quarter of a teaspoon in five gallons of water, and it's the water that is showing that benefit to your plant, right? So there's those kinds of things. So, um, so we talked about shatter staging and... There's tools and tool rules, right, for which kinds of tools you use and keeping them sharp. Do any of you sharpen your own tools at home? Yeah, and where'd you learn to do it? <laughs> okay, you want to teach a class? <laughs> we, um, I am just learning still how to do it. I think I just, it turns out I've just been doing it wrong. Um, and so I did get one of our volunteers on Thursday. He offered to sharpen the tools in the learning garden, and so I videotaped him doing it. Um, so I'm learning how to do it. And, it, and man, it makes an incredible difference. How fun. Uh, so that's an important thing is keeping your tools sharp enough. If you're ever trying to make a cut and you're having to use two hands, stop. Either your tool's not sharp enough or you need to move up to the next level to go to loppers. And if you're ever using loppers and you find yourself like using your hip to like, Ugh! stop, that's a clue that it's time to move up to a saw size and that you're using the wrong tool. Um, we're often using the wrong tool because it's just what we have in our hands. I am trying to think, I don't necessarily know that we have a lot of problems with rose diseases in New Mexico that would be transferred by uh, pruning tools. There are some. Um, one of them is fire blight. Fire blight is a huge problem in New Mexico in apples and pears, but doesn't tend to be as big of a problem in roses. I don't know exactly why, but um, there are studies that have shown that uh, depending on if it's something fungal or viral or, bac or bacterial that you're trying to rid uh, from your shears, there are different s disinfectants that you could use. So are you using uh, peroxide or alcohol or bleach or Lysol or, or uh, generic Lysol? They all work for different things. Um, there's some evidence that, especially if you have nice tools that you don't want to use for a long time, that the 10% bleach solution can damage the actual blades and lead to pocking that then is a little harbor for bacterial problems so maybe not but um and and the the research at, that has been done by um my uh, so that an extension horticulturist at washington state university that that the final the final line of all of this discussion of pros and cons is like a household disinfectant like a generic lysol it works great you can get it in the wipe form. You can make your own wipes. You could um, spray. Also, I, I do like using the, lice, the, um, the spray when I'm using tools that have a serrated edge, right? And depending on how prone you are to cutting yourself, I mean, you can cut yourself just by wiping this. So maybe spray is the best option. Look at these cute ones. You just keep them in your pocket. Wee, wee, wee. So uh, that's what I recommend using. So... Um, so yeah, but you can stand, you can have a, um, oh, did I bring my little torch? I have a mini torch. So you can stand there and like, like a little Bunsen burner kind of action and disinfect your tools. It depends on how fast you're going and what you want to do. So between shrubs, it's a good idea to get into the, m into the habit of cleaning tools. If you're doing your shrub cleaning and your rose cleaning, your rose pruning, and you have fruit trees, it's better just to get in the habit of cleaning your tools every couple cuts or I don't know what, right? Every time you look at your phone, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how often, right? Certainly in between plants, 
And if you're going to your uh, neighbor's yard, I should clean these before I go to my neighbor's, if she ever asks me for my help. Um, <laughs> so we want to try to prevent spreading disease for sure. Yeah. In this, the one that I pruned yesterday, um, I noticed that some of those, it's older canes that are in the center. And I think that's okay. And you can leave. So a lot of people can't stand those and they say, take that out first. I agree in terms of knowing what to prune and going ahead and making a decision. Go ahead and take those out. But they're not harming anything. You can leave them in. I know that our fruit trees at the research farm, you know, they, um, to a lot of people, there's like, you know, dead wood on it. I don't like using our university tools to cut the dead wood. It takes forever and it's exhausting and de demoralizing and then you you ruin the tool at the same time so i just kind of i would rather leave the dead wood in and just not worry about it but it depends on what you want if someone were to recommend it they would say it could be as something simple like a tablespoon of dish soap and a gallon of water but but i used to do that and i would make my little soapy solution and go to town spraying but if there are beneficial insects there you're killing those too if there are no insects there, then you're just spraying the air and that's okay, maybe, right? It's not as, I, I prefer it to some other chemicals, right? But um, yeah, but I, but I don't recommend it. What, what else, you know, I'm trying to think of an, where I might use that. A lot of insects have already, they have, um, they build or they, they exude this waxy substance, right? The mealybug or cochineal, cochineal scale that's a type of scale insect that uh, has a, has, or scale, the word scale, because it has a little coating, whether it's fluffy and white or just a hard shell, so that when you spray, it doesn't, it's not killed by that anyway. So maybe it's more futile. But I also like the idea that if, if, if the idea, if, you, if, you, if your neighbor is getting out close to her plants and doing that on a regular basis, I like that. And if it means some soapy water, that's okay. I'd rather people get closer and look Guess what? I have examples of that too. So have you ever seen before, notice this, let's see. See how green this peach stem is? The other side is red. Is that sunlight though? It's a, it's a reaction, it's a, it's a response to direct sun. And so um, this, the anthocyanins that create this red color, it's almost like a sunscreen in the cells, so it's not that, so these cells clearly have chlorophyll, right? But these cells have chlorophyll and they have this other purpley color, purpley red, that helps to protect that side from the afternoon sun. Mm. And then oh, this is oh, all I would call that, see. instead of red, I would call that color dead. Oh, okay, <laughs> so I should prune it. I don't need it. <laughs>